It was during the early 1900s when America was starting to emerge as a world power that the first Roosevelt made his prophetic statement on international diplomacy with the advice to talk softly but carry a big stick. Half a century later, when the United States stood as the world's champion against communism, its big stick was undoubtedly the Convair B-36 long-range bomber. Although this mammoth aircraft was to serve throughout the 1950s, it could actually trace its origin back even before America entered the Second World War. The 36 was to earn its apt, if unofficial, title of peacemaker. By 1941, the United States Army Air Force had two effective heavy bombers at its disposal. They were the legendary B-17 designed by the Boeing Company. This superb four-engined aircraft was to serve throughout the war and the heavily armed later versions were understandably known as the Flying Fortresses. The later model was the consolidated B-24 Liberator. The Liberator featured an advanced tricycle undercarriage which permitted higher speed landings and the design saw service in all theatres of the war. However, the larger, bulkier fuselage enabled some models to be converted into transports, making the B-24 one of the most versatile aircraft in the American inventory. The Liberator, like the 17, was also heavily defended and it was also able to fly slightly higher than the Fortress. Importantly, it offered greater range, so it was often used for maritime patrol work, flying what at the time were considered very long distances on internal fuel. However, the B-17 and the B-24 were only able to make the trip from America to Europe one way. In 1941, the Army Air Force also had on order another bomber, ultimately able to fly still higher and further than those preceding it. Another Boeing design, the B-29 Super Fortress, was undoubtedly the most powerful bomber to sea service throughout the entire conflict. But even though several hundred were on order, there was not even a single prototype in the air. A second backup concept should the B-29 fail in any way was the consolidated B-32 Dominator. This aircraft was not produced in any great numbers, but it did provide a reassuring alternative to the Super Fortress's phenomenal capability. However, in 1941, it too could only be seen on the blueprint. By the middle of that year, continental Europe was in Nazi hands as the German juggernaut enjoyed success after success. More importantly, although Britain had regained some supremacy in the air, it still suffered from constant punishing bombardment from the Luftwaffe, which devastated its people and its industry. These raids, often at night, but sometimes in daylight, 
was seen by the German high command as a means to bring the island nation to its knees. The burning question which American tacticians struggled with was simply, what would happen if the US was brought into the conflict and the sole remaining Allied base in Europe was to be lost to Germany? One possibility American strategists considered was the development of an aircraft with such phenomenal range that it would actually be able to start from bases on the American East Coast, fly the entire span of the Atlantic to deliver its payload, and then return to continental America without any form of refueling or fighter protection. The American aviation industry had produced long-range bombers in the past. The first of these was an early Boeing project, the XB-15. This aircraft was to have a wingspan of almost 150 feet, but needed all of the power of its four 1,000 horsepower engines to lift its 35 tons of bulk into the air. The second experimental long-range bomber was developed by the Douglas Company, and the prototype, XB-19, was ordered in September 1936. This aircraft, with a wingspan of 212 feet, was still larger than the XB-15 when completed. The task required 500 men, 9,000 drawings, and 2 million man-hours, plus $1.4 million of the military's funds. It also cost Douglas an estimated $4 million over its original budget. Clearly, developing mammoth aircraft was an expensive business. Nevertheless, the XB-19 was a true watershed in aviation standards, not only in size, but also in innovation. It was the first aircraft built with retractable tricycle undercarriage and designed to have power-operated guns and a tail gun turret. Had it gone into production, it would also have offered a range of in excess of 7,000 miles. The information gained from the XB-15 and 19 projects, knowledge of the inadequacies of the aircraft inventory in the early 1940s, and the looming prospect of having to wage a European war from American shores, the American Defence Department contemplated the problems of producing an extra long-range heavy bomber to do the round trip across the Atlantic. To do this, it called upon designs from Northrop and Consolidated. The Northrop design was nothing if not unique. The concept worked on the premise that if an aircraft could be produced without the drag effect of the fuselage and tailplane, considerable range would be achieved. Therefore, Northrop set about designing an aircraft which by any other name was just a wing, a flying wing. And on the 25th of October 1941, an order was placed for two XB-35 experimental bombers. The consolidated design was more conventional than its competitor, in shape, but certainly not in size. With an overall wing area of just under 5,000 square feet, the B-36 was to require no less than six engines placed at the back of the wing to push its massive 163-foot fuselage through the air. And on the 25th of November 1941, an order was approved for two aircraft in the hope that the first would be developed by mid-1944 at a fixed fee of approximately $800,000 each. As it happened, the much-needed bomber bases in Britain were never denied to the Army Air Force, and as a result, the standard B-17 and B-24 heavy bombers were able to attack Axis targets from 1942 onwards. Delivered in their thousands, the fortresses and liberators were to wrench a terrible price from the enemy. The longer distances required by the Pacific Theater were amply met by Boeing's B-29 especially after the capture of the Mariana Islands in mid-1944, which gave the superfortress the stepping stone which enabled the Air Force to reach the heart of Japan. But it was one particular B-29 with one particular bomb 
that was to bring the Second World War and much military aircraft development to an end. Two exceptions to this were experimental long-range bombers ordered only weeks before American involvement in the conflict, but never given sufficient priority until the war's end, and the need to deliver a new weapon, never perceived in the tactician's wildest dreams four years earlier. The first, Northrop B-35, was actually constructed in the open and completed in June 1946. This clever design, which was the source of controversy for many years, was powered by four pusher engines and was intended to carry a crew of nine in the pressurised centre section, for its shape barely allowed the word fuselage to be applied. However, the radical new shape, which relied upon flaperons on the end of each wing in lieu of a conventional tailplane, was never to completely overcome stability shortcomings. But the flying wing must surely go down in history as one of the most brilliant aviation concepts ever conceived. The first XB-36 was wheeled out of the experimental hangar just six days after Japan surrendered, but it was to be August 1946, nearly five years after it was ordered, before the peacemaker was to be ready to fly. The prototype's single main wheels were 100 inches in diameter and the largest ever made for an aircraft, but this was to prove a major weakness. The six pusher-type engines were to have their air intakes on the forward section of the wings. However, this advanced concept for the time was also to provide initial difficulties in cooling the engines and would require later modification. On August the 8th, 1946, the first XB-36 under the command of Captain Beryl A. Erickson rolled down the Fort Worth runway with a total crew of nine and 8,000 gallons of fuel. At exactly 10 minutes past one in the morning, he lifted Convair's giant aerial masterpiece into the air for the first time. It was the biggest plane ever to fly, even in Texas. The flight was to continue for no more than 37 minutes, during which time the undercarriage was to remain in the wheels down position as a safety precaution. Ericsson's crew on this and many subsequent occasions were to put the giant aircraft through many vigorous tasks which quickly identified the problems of giantism. One of the most formidable being the vibration caused by such enormous engines spaced out over the wide distances of the wing. And cooling was another problem, especially at high altitude. It was obvious that there would be many areas requiring major attention. But perhaps the most fundamental was the simple concept of the massive wheel arrangement which limited Convair's bomber to runways at least 22 inches thick and, as there were only three of these available anywhere in America, clearly an answer needed to be found and found quickly. The answer came in what was considered another breakthrough by combining four 56-inch wheels into a group under each wing, thus spreading the B-36 phenomenal weight over the much wider area, thereby permitting the peacemaker to use runways of half the previously required thickness. Very early in the B-36 concept, Convair could see the potential of utilising its enormous wings and tailplane for the transport version of the Peacemaker's commercial cousin, the XC-99, which was ready for its maiden flight in November 1947. Still larger again than its bomber counterpart, 
The 99 was assembled at Convair's San Diego operation, but with wings and other common parts shipped across the nation from Fort Worth. Here at Lindenburg Field, what had now become the world's largest plane was to demonstrate the potential that would lead to the mammoth transport and airline concepts that followed decades later. The 99 was to attract considerable attention by Pan Am, who seriously considered a civil version for the west coast to Hawaii run, and actually took out options on three such aircraft. But as predicted, the early post-war airline boom was not to transpire for many years. The XC-99 was never to see civil service, and the sole example produced remained in active service with the Air Force until 1957, and became particularly invaluable during the Korean War when it was used to rush essential payloads from one side of the nation to the other. This aircraft too had to be modified with a new undercarriage system, but when it was, it proved extremely versatile and had, if required, the potential to lift 400 fully equipped troops. Yet, practically, it was just too soon for its time. However, Convair's main interest had always been with the extra long-range bomber concept, and it continued to develop and refine the B-36 throughout the late 40s, emphasizing that this weapon alone provided the ultra-long range to strike virtually any target in the world and return to its base in America. Long range would require many hours of physical endurance for the crew, and therefore inside the 36's massive fuselage, adequate provision was made for sleeping quarters and a galley complete with a two-burner stove. Ample provisions were always provided. However, the centre pressurised section which held these amenities was actually no less than 80 feet from the forward control area which was only accessible via a narrow tunnel spanning the distance. Heated food was packed in specially designed containers for conveying between the vast distances of the two pressurised sections. The tunnel also served as the only means to convey personnel from one crew section to another, and because of the distances involved, a small trolley was provided to enable each member to propel himself more effectively. Problems generated by the size of the 36 also required other unique procedures never previously required by other aircraft. Immediately after takeoff and before the plane was pressurized, a crew member was given the responsibility of examining certain vulnerable areas within the massive interior structure which formed the fuselage of the 36. Only then would the plane be allowed to climb to higher altitudes and continue with its mission. Other problems in dealing with the size of the 36 came to light. There was the question of how to service each of the massive aircraft which was so big that special outdoor hangars had to be constructed so that only the essential parts could be accessible. And although the problems of engine vibration and cooling had been successfully resolved, there is no doubt that there were grave concerns with the viability of the B-36 in competition with other alternatives. Firstly, the project's original competitor, the Flying Wing, had been upgraded to an all-jet aircraft, replacing the four propellers with eight turbojet engines. Northrop hoped to increase the speed and viability of its quite brilliant concept, which utilised unique flaperons, shown here at the end of the wing, to make up for the absence of the conventional tailplane.
Another and more conventional competitor of the 36 also came from the past. This was the Boeing B-50. The aircraft was really just a standard super fortress of Second World War vintage, but with more powerful engines and extended range from the underwing mounted fuel tanks. This range was enhanced yet again by Boeing's successful development of aerial in-flight refueling. Thus the Air Force had available to it a proven aeroplane combination which could fly the same range as the 36 but without having to address the problems of giantism. By the late 40s, due to these innovations, the future of the B-36 looked very bleak indeed. Its salvation came from two major developments. The first one, poetically enough, was also provided by Consolidated's long-term competitor, Boeing. For Boeing developed the successful medium-range bomber entirely powered by jets, but utilising captured German technology which showed the benefits of a swept back wing. Boeing's B-47 was to have the wing that was not only swept, but was so flexible that it could move within an arc of 17 feet. However, so that the wing could remain thin, the six engines had to be mounted in pods suspended from below. The outer pods contained one engine apiece, but the inboard pods contained two engines which were suspended several feet below the wing surface. And it was with this equipment that the engineers from both companies worked together to attach to the far outside wing of Boeing's giant. With six turning and four burning, the 36 was at last, in part, entering into the jet age. The other event which was to secure the future of the 36 took place on June the 24th, 1948, when the Soviets closed the gate on Berlin, signalling in one step the beginning of the Cold War. Now, the growing concerns of communism polarised into an action which shocked the West out of its post-war complacency. As NATO forces now found they were confronted with a potent adversary, in a matter of days the need for an intercontinental bomber had gone from hypothetical to the very real. At this stage, there was no one plane in the world able to fulfil the long-range potential of a Convair giant, and rather than cancellation, orders for the peacemaker were actually increased. As concern continued, the importance of America's Strategic Air Command, which was responsible for long-range bombing, increased considerably, and it was ultimately placed under the direct command of General Curtis LeMay. LeMay had an impeccable Second World War record. It started with his early involvement in the European bombardment with the Army Air Force, and continued to when he took command of the Pacific operations and the B-29 bombardment of Japan considered one of the great strategists in American wartime experience. He also supervised the Berlin airlift and was now seen as the most qualified person to bring the Strategic Air Command, including its fast-growing fleet of 36s, to the highest possible state of readiness. Under LeMay's iron leadership of SAC, the American public took comfort in the fact that although they now no longer had a monopoly on atomic weaponry, that at least they had what was probably the best platform for delivery, the B-36. So concerned was the military about protecting its intercontinental bomber that security was stepped up to effectively a wartime footing, and personnel in SAC control rooms were required to carry firearms, even though they were in fact hundreds of miles inside American borders. The concern to protect America's big stick even required mechanics servicing the engines to carry firearms whilst they worked. Exercises continued at an ever-increasing pace. Night and day, and in all weathers, LeMay worked his crews. Checklist complete. Ready for takeoff. Over. Pilot checklist complete. Ready for takeoff. Roger, give me 100% on the jet. Roger. Jet's coming up. Engineer, give me full power. Full power coming on. Jet's 100%. Stay apart, tempo K. Okay. Takeoff power is set. Everything stabilized. Engineer, ready for takeoff. Roger. Carswell Tower, Air Force 653, ready for takeoff. Air Force 653, Carswell Tower, roger, clear to roll. Roger, 653, rolling. Here we go. Give me five. 
Command power. Roger. Command power coming on. Be 96% on the jet. Roger, 96% on the jets. Usually flying as single aircraft rather than in formation, SACS peacemakers would practice bombing raids over vast distances and at next to no notice. The 36s utilized a K-1 bombing navigation system for precision accuracy. The K-1 system contained no less than 365 vacuum tubes and enabled the 36 to bomb at high speed in any weather. Pilot, go ahead. Pilot will be over the prime point in 20 minutes. The target was usually a radio signal from special trucks built to gauge the accuracy of SACS aircraft. Although the fact that B-36s were to cost over $5 million apiece, they, together with the K-1 system and LeMay's insistence upon constant training, provided a combination which was anything if not accurate. Pilot, this is radar. We're over the IP. Pick up the heading of 197. Bob Water for 653. Over the IP. Altitude 35,000 on an inbound heading of 197 degrees. Bomb flight air force 653. Three zero seconds to go. The bomb's away. The pencil in the plotter's hand represents the plane moving over the graph scale towards the target. Arms away. However, despite the enormous potential of the Convair giant, detractors often considered its large size to make it a prime target for enemy fighters, and even before the first 36 even flew, the Air Force ordered a unique auxiliary, the McDonnell Goblin, as a parasite fighter to be actually carried within the B-36. This incredible design consisted of the barest essentials and had fold-down wings which would enable the aircraft to be totally concealed within the 36's bomb bay. Never actually used with the Peacemaker, its flight controls were conducted from a B-29 mothership and flight trials commenced in 1948. In August, with test pilot Ed Scorch secured in the cockpit, the Goblin was launched by a trapeze mechanism from the B-29 and the pilot successfully flew what must be one of America's most remarkable fighters. However, when Scorch came to reconnect the Goblin hook to the trapeze, Turbulence lifted the little fighter and the mother plane mechanism broke the canopy and wrenched the oxygen mask away from the pilot. But Scorch was just able to regain control and crash land this tiny fighter. This setback did not stop development. The second and only other goblin produced continued its task. Eventually, on October the 14th, 1948, a successful hookup was effected and the Goblin pulled into the 29's belly. But this bomber-parasite fighter combination, although bold in concept, was never to be adopted because it seemed to present as many problems as it tried to solve. However, a later parasite project involving the B-36 was the FICON fighter conveyor concept. This program began in 1952 and involved mating up a Republic F-84 directly underneath a modified peacemaker. There was no intention of fully consuming the F-84 within the mother craft. Not until after the aircraft and its parasite were in the air would the fighter pilot enter into its cockpit and he, working as a team with the highly trained boom operator who was positioned in the mother plane, would attempt the delicate and skillful task of lowering the fighter via a large hydraulic operated boom to a point below the bomber where the fighter could be successfully released.
This task actually proved very successful, and the process of recoupling, although requiring great skill, was perfected to a fine art. The combination of these aircraft provided many potentials, especially as the pilot was able to come and go from the fighter when it was in the docked position. In actual fact, the FICON mission was really perceived more to extend the reconnaissance capacity of the B-36. The F-84, either in its straight or swept wing form, was an extremely versatile aircraft. And although SAC employed it as its own fighter aircraft, there is no doubt that it could perform the role of an effective fighter bomber as it demonstrated so capably over Korea. That sack would now carry such versatile aircraft thousands of miles to the very edge of enemy territory and small compact nuclear weapons were under development at the same time, it seems probable that SAC could have used its FICON combination in the bomber role. By the middle 50s, the B-36 was fully developed and deployed at various SAC bases around the nation. By the early 50s, SAC's peacemakers were at the peak of their development, with the early engine and vibration problems resolved. With the support of jet power and modifications such as a new quick-action bomb bay door, the B-36 personified the ultimate intercontinental atomic bomber of the era. Despite the technical success of the project, it still was to continually suffer from political and inter-service criticism. And even as early as 1949, there had been an investigation into the political influences relating to the 36, all of which came to nothing. But the Navy's resentment of the peacemaker was stronger and probably more founded. Its promised 65,000 tonne supercarrier was to have the capacity to deliver atomic attacks on would-be Soviet industrial centres and was cancelled, partly because of the Air Force insistence that the 36 deterrent was far more flexible and did not represent the eggs-in-one-basket philosophy of a carrier. What was equally important was that SAC claimed it was just as able to operate from the edge of enemy territory and in conditions that would have been impossible for naval aviation. demonstrate their point, B-36s were to regularly fly from their home bases in central USA to the very edge of Soviet territory. Highly trained crews of pilots, navigators, radio operators, engineers and gunners would prepare for long hours of flight, often at very high altitudes, over thousands of miles to the frozen wastelands of Alaska. These men would know that once into the Arctic region, should their aircraft fail and crash land, and some did, there was very little chance of survival in the sub-zero and uninhabited wilderness. Against these prospects, the roar of the Peacemaker's six-piston and four jet engines must have sounded far more a blessing than a curse.
the Navy's criticism of the peacemakers still continued. At one time, they actually made a formal request to the Air Force for the use of a 36 to test its defensive capability against Navy fighters. Outwardly, it displayed very little defensive armament, but covered under sliding panels, the peacemaker concealed six remotely controlled turrets, each with two 20mm cannons. These turrets could be hydronically raised as required, and when used in conjunction with the forward nose turret and radar-controlled rear turret, combined to offer no less than 16 cannons, covering every approach for a range of over half a mile, making the Peacemaker the most heavily defended aircraft in aviation history. Ellison Air Force Base in Alaska was a point to which many B-36s on exercise would travel. Here, Peacemaker's captains would land their massive aircraft, never knowing beforehand just what weather conditions would prevail as they made their approach. For some, the function would be little different than that at Offutt, thousands of miles away. But with the weather constantly changing, for others following close behind, visibility would be close to zero, testing the pilot's skill and resolve to the limit. Once down, each aircraft would be quickly guided away to its service area and waiting heated buses would be quickly on hand to collect the tired and weary crew, who despite the winter protection would doubtless be noticing the contrast from what might have been Texas to Alaska non-stop. Even here, where weather conditions provided as much protection for aircraft on the ground as it did risk for those in the air, anti-aircraft protection was always in abundance. Under this protection, ground crew would immediately work on landed aircraft. For these men, it was not a short trip from aircraft to heated bus. They had to come to terms with the hostile environment as best they could. In quick order, aircraft would be refueled by a crew working on the ice-cold wing surfaces, a fall from which could prove fatal. clothes and gloved hands, these ground crews took perhaps a different, but nonetheless as real a risk as those who flew. With time, always the enemy. Each engine would be allocated its own crewman to make the necessary checks before the weather closed in. So cold was the region that if aircraft had been standing for anything more than a short time, the engine would require supplementary heating, mainly through the giant air intakes, to ensure the equipment was not frozen solid. To achieve this, large mobile heating plants were developed which could pipe vast amounts of hot air into and around all the piston engines. The crew compartment was also given the same treatment, not merely to make the area habitable, but because the instrumentation and onboard equipment simply would not work effectively in such a cold environment. <laughs> Refueled and ready to go, 36ers would again brave the cold Arctic sky on the way back south leaving the area to its natural inhabitants. 
But the real purpose of these exercises was to demonstrate that from Alaskan bases it would be just as easy to turn northwest to Soviet territory and deliver the devastating cargo around which the 36 was developed. Cargo of another sort was identified. Convair, which designed the 36, won the contract for the Air Force's first supersonic bomber, the B-58 Hustler, which was the culmination of Convair's long involvement with the Delta design. It was found that moving from base to base an as yet unflown bomber was not an easy task until it was temporarily mounted under a standard 36 with its two inboard props removed to protect the Hustler wingtips. This image symbolizes beyond all else the difference between the two generations of aircraft. In the space of less than 10 years, the quest to improve the speed of bomber aircraft had so radically changed the shape and size that tomorrow's medium bomber was able to fit comfortably under yesterday's heavy bomber. Clearly, the age of giantism was coming to a close, and yet Convair still held hopes for its mammoth in an upgraded form. The company produced the YB-60 in response to the Air Force requirement for an all-jet heavy bomber. But hopes were high at Fort Worth in April 1952 when the 60 made its first public debut. The continuation of the production line would guarantee the jobs of thousands of staff involved and subcontractors. It would have brought added prosperity to the city, which had produced the world's biggest bomber. The YB-60 was virtually a B-36 with new fully swept wings and tailplane. Having no defensive armament other than the rear turret, the entire rear crew and quarters were omitted. Added power and less weight brought the YB-60 to a top speed of just over 500 miles per hour and its production was achieved in rapid time as 70% of its components were standard to the 36. Two such examples were ordered by the Air Force to test the concept but only one was to actually fly. The apparent enthusiasm of the test crew was not shared by the Air Force. They preferred Boeing's all-new design B-52, the Strato Fortress, which, although more expensive, offered better performance in range and speed, shown here next to the original Boeing heavy bomber. On August the 14th, 1954, at a ceremony at Convair's production line in Fort Worth, the last B-36 was handed over to the Air Force. Final delivery from the Peacemaker plant must have been a bittersweet affair for the Fort Worth people, 
because although Convair was to continue to use the plant for many successful projects, it was from this base that they'd produced what was for many years the biggest plane ever to fly. And a plane that many would say because of its sheer size won a war without having to fight.